I would like to turn now to three other parts of human and animal bodies, the rib cage, the stomach, and the brain, in connection with fetalization and hypermorphosis. When we look at the rib cage of humans and compare it to other primates, we notice that the human rib cage is quite flat compared to the lower and lower primates, to say nothing of other mammals. The flat rib cage is connected to the fact that the vertebral column of the human being is more central to the torso than it is in other primates. This more central position, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, allows the weight of the torso to be carried in a very efficient way, since that weight is more evenly distributed around the vertebral column, given the vertical stance of the human. In the lower primates, the vertebral column is further back in the torso, so the rib cage is below the vertebral column, and the weight of much of the torso needs to be carried in this less efficient and easy way. The less vertical the spinal column, the more weight that must be carried below it. In this picture, we see a bird's eye view of the macaque and the human rib cages. We see that the macaque's rib cage is more barrel-like and that its vertebral column is situated further back than in the flatter human rib cage. In humans and chimpanzees, the spine shifts towards the middle as growth progresses from infancy on. So this growth is considered hypermorphic, a hypermorphic phenomenon connected with upright posture. Also important is that the scapula, the shoulder blade of the macaque, is on the side as it is in other lower catarines whereas the scapula of the human being and the anthropoid apes, it is in the back. This rear placement of the scapula allows the human arm to rotate to an incredible degree. This access of rotation is very great and this contributes to the functionality of that universally formed organ, the human hand. The versatile human hand would be much less effective if the arm's movement were restricted as it is, let's say, in horses who can only move their legs in a forward and backward direction. They can't do this. The use of tools, one of those special human capacities, would be very limited. I remember uh, my paleontology teacher in college rotating his arms in front of us one day to show the fact that the human arm could not rotate fully into the space directly in back of us, demonstrating that the human arm's movement was not perfect. Be that as it may, it is still so that the placement of the scapula in the back gives the anthropoid apes and the humans a very large range of movement. Let us turn now to the stomach in various mammals and the human. We see in this picture that the human stomach is very simple while the other animals shown here, culminating in the cow, have more and more complex stomachs. 
This again is a case of humans retaining a fetalized, simple form of that organ. Let's now consider the brain. We know that the brain has different levels with different functions. Simply put, we have the so-called reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and the neocortex that serves higher cognitive functions. Here we can note that the neocortex in human ontogeny, in the human lifespan, covers more and more of the lower parts of the brain, starting its growth from the back and moving forward in the fetus and in the infant until in time it completely covers and hides the other brains. The neocortex in humans undergoes hypermorphosis. It's fascinating to see that within the cranium, which retains its rounded fetal form into adulthood, there grows and develops the hypermorphic brain. In this case, as in so many others, fetalization and hypermorphosis work together. Here we can see in this drawing that in the higher mammals, the mammalian brain is increasingly overgrown by the neocortex. In humans, the lower brains are no longer visible from outside. I'd like to finish this section of this presentation by showing you a very intriguing graph. On the x-axis, we see greater and greater specialization in animals as we move to the right. Right under the x-axis, you will see three arrows pointing to the left, indicating greater and greater fetalization. So we can say that greater fetalization is opposed to greater specialization. And on the y-axis, we see greater and greater hypermorphosis due to retardation, which also indicates a longer lifespan. In arrows one, two, and three, we see that they all begin in the same place, in that dotted box below. But they increasingly diverge. Arrow one, which reaches very far up, there we see that this hypothetical organism has diverged very little from the original form, while at the same time it has undergone a great deal of hypermorphosis and shows a very long lifespan. In arrow two, we see an organism that has undergone quite a bit of hypermorphosis but it has also undergone a substantial amount of specialization as shown by the arrow's movement to the right. Finally, in arrow three, the organism in question has undergone specialization much earlier in its lifespan, and any tendency towards hypermorphosis has been curtailed due to compressed ontogeny. This graph can be a help in understanding how retardation, fetalization, and hypermorphosis 
work together in a dynamic way, helping to create the human form and also the great variety of animals that we find in the world with their many incredible adaptations and specializations.